Thank you, Claire. So I'm acutely aware this is the first presentation of many today, and uh, Claire has already assured me that she'll be taking no prisoners if I run over, so I'll get straight into it. I'll be talking today about the fungicide performance in both wheat and barley, uh, and I'll start by talking about wheat. Just before uh, I get into this, though, I would like to say, I think I'm right in saying many of you in the room today are very familiar with this work. You'll have seen it before uh, over many years. Uh, that said, there are undoubtedly some people here today that are less familiar with it and perhaps even seeing it for the first time. Uh, and for that reason, I'd just like to give a very brief introduction to it by saying, really, this is actually quite a unique piece of work. It's been running now for 20 years. Yeah, that's right, it started in 1994. Uh, back then, if you talked about live streams, probably it was a cue to get your fishing rod out. If you go back then, actually, the, the situation was very different. We were looking at nodorum and rusts, mainly as the prime diseases. And over the last 20 years, the, direct, the, the objectives of the trials, though, have remained, remained the same. They're as relevant today as they were then. Uh, and those are really primarily to provide sound, independent information on the efficacy of new and existing products so that we can provide, or rather we can see how new product products compare with the standards that we're using today, but also so we can see how existing products are changing over time. And we'll be covering both those points as we go through the trials today. Just before I go on further as well, I should just say the organisations funding this, uh, it's primarily HGCA. That said, Chuggers also provide a site in Ireland uh, and contribute the data uh, to the project. From that, uh, the three organisations doing the trial work uh, are ADAS, NIABTAG and uh, SRUC, and they form the representatives from those organisations, form the Fungicide Working Group, which acts as a steering group for the project. In 2013, uh, the sites that we had for this project were um, many. We had four sites looking at Septoria, uh, one in Herefordshire, one in Hampshire, um, one in Ireland, uh, and one in, in Fife as well. Um, you'll note there are two trials in there that are called double trials. Uh, you might be wondering what that is. Essentially, at those sites, there are two experiments, two completely separate experiments, one looking at T1 timings, the other looking at T2 timings. We don't actually think there is any difference in the rank order of the products or how they perform at those timings. The one thing we do tend to find, though, is at T2 timings, we tend to find more eradicant activity from these trials, and at T1, more protectant. So it's a way of making sure or trying to get a broader spectrum of activity from the work that we do. It's not just about septoria, though. We have yellow rust, brown rust, mildew trials as well to try and pick up differences in product efficacy on those diseases as well. What products have we been testing? Well, these are for the septoria trials. Uh, in every season, we have some standard treatments that we test. Uh, and in 2013, that was Bravo, Ignite, uh, Opus Max. That's basically the EC formulation of epoxiconazole. Um, Proline in there. Uh, Phoenix as well. We are also testing two SDHIs alone as standard solo products, um, Imtrex and Vertizan, that's Floxapyroxad and Pentheoparad. And we, we, we've got three mixtures in there, two, we're looking at Aviator, Adexar, uh, and Vertizan plus Ignite, which was included for the first time in 2012, and Vertizan was registered in uh, March, I think, last year or this year, rather, I should say. And now the clicker is working. Just to say, Pentheoparad plus uh, Ignite, um, in 2012, we tested a slightly different formulation uh, to what we tested in 2013. It's essentially as a result of a change in the uh, registered rate uh, we were initially told that we were likely to see a registered rate of 1.25, uh, so we tested 1.25 with uh, 1.25 of Ignite. In 2013, though, it was registered as 1.5 litres as a full rate, uh, and so we tested that at full rate of both those two actives to keep the ratios the same. 
And we have actually still managed to be able to get a cross-season graph for that, as I'll come on to. What did we actually find from 2013? Well, it was quite a quiet year for disease generally. Uh, what we did get, though, was some very good protectant information from the trials. We had eight trials that gave leaf layers that had protectant activity on them. Uh, one site with eradicant activity uh, and some yellow rust information as well from Terrington. We didn't get any brown rust data and we didn't get any mildew uh, last year, just simply as a result of uh, both those two pathogens being fairly hard to find uh, because of the season. I'll go on straight on to look at some of the data now. Uh, this is the protectant information from 2013. Uh, just before I describe it, I should say a little bit about these graphs. On the left-hand side on these charts, uh, we have the single active products, products containing just a single active ingredient. On the right-hand side, we've got the mixtures. You can read across from left to right. I should just get a quick disclaimer in here as well. Um, we apply in these trials quarter, half, full, and we even go right up to double label rates. You can't do that in the field yourselves, um, but we do it within these trials so that we can better fit the points around the full label rate. You can see from this data, though, uh, quite clearly, uh, Opus and Proline, or rather, I should say, Ignite and Proline on the left-hand side, the brown and the blue lines, following a very similar path. And we've seen this for a number of years now. Their efficacy uh, is very, very similar uh, in, on protectant activity on Septoria. Uh, Phoenix in there as well, in green. Uh, clearly, I mean, that's providing, was providing about 50% control in the protectant situation last year. Uh, and Phoenix is a multi-site protectant, and that may well yet have a role to play in helping us manage Septoria uh, in the future, as well as now as well, uh, in mixtures with other products. Chlorothalonil, chlorothalonil, or Bravo, is in there as a single star. We test it at just a half rate, and you can see that uh, in there at just around 1%. It was performing exceptionally well last year as a protectant. It has done for a number of years, um, but still a very useful multi-site uh, one thing that is quite clear, though, is the straight uh, SDHIs here. We have two, Vertizan and Intrex, and both were performing very, very well on their own uh, in, protecting, in protecting against Septoria. And I think it's that gap between the Azoles and the SDHIs that is perhaps what we're seeing uh, increase over the years. Uh, I think if we went back five years, you'd see that gap was, was narrower, and I'll come on to the reasons why a little bit later. On the right-hand side, as you look at it, uh, we have the mixtures, and all of the mixtures were performing very well in a protecting situation at anything over a half-label rate. Perhaps might pull out that a Dexar looked a little bit stronger when compared as a percentage of the full-label rate, remembering, of course, that the full-label rate of a Dexar is, is two litres. Uh, that doesn't come as any great surprise to us. If we look at the protectant activity now over two years... It's pretty much the same pattern. Actually, Phoenix, you probably say, on average, giving us about 40% control over those two years. Again, the Opus Pro line, or the Ignite Pro line, I should say, uh, situation exactly as we would expect, and that gap between Intrex and, uh, and Opus and Pro line, very clear. Uh, and again, on the right-hand side, Vertizan plus Ignite, uh, looking very similar to Aviator, rate for rate there, and the are looking slightly stronger, as we would expect. Looking at the eradicant activity, we've mean this across two years rather than look at any individual season. Um, again, what's slightly disturbing is the eradicant activity that we see from the Azoles now. Um, we've seen it for a few years, in fact, within these trials. Um, they are providing a level of eradicant activity, but it's quite uh, significantly reduced to what we would have seen 10 or 15 years ago. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail a little bit later. Intrex looking very strong in a, in a curative situation as well. And if we look at the mixtures on the right-hand side, um, actually Aviator and Adexar over the last two years have really followed each other rate for rate. Um, it's probably quite hard to dis decide or, to or say whether Vertizan plus Ignite is actually better because we haven't been able to fit the points to that curve based on the reasons that I stated earlier uh, because we were using different rates in the two seasons. But uh, it certainly looks to be as good as the other products when compared on this basis. 
We'll just go on to look at the rusts now. Um, it was a strange season for rusts last year, given the very cold spring that we had. Um, it's fair to say, when we did get some useful yellow rust information, uh, and yellow rust is certainly still a major issue in Oakley uh, and a whole range of different varieties, including Solstice, Galant, Kielder, Viscount. I'm sure you could name others as well. Um, brown rust, we didn't actually get any data out of last year's se season. We did see brown rust uh, in some sites very late on in the season, um, but it was not at sufficient levels within our research trials to actually pick out uh, differences. It's a real concern, brown rust. I think over 50% of the recommended list varieties are uh, rated five or less for brown rust these days. Uh, and for those of you that can remember 2006, 2007, um, it can be a major problem where we have mild autumn and winter conditions uh, and a mild start to the season. Um, clearly, winter, determines, winter conditions will be key. But if it continues as mild as it is now, and I understand that brown rust is already being found in some sites, we could be dealing with a situation where we're trying to control brown rust early in the season for a change. So it's one to watch out for. Looking at the data that we have on yellow rust from last year, though, um, I'm going to look at this the other way around. I think you can see it from the bottom up. Actually, on rusts, the azoles are still king. Uh, proline, epoxyconazole in Ignite there, both looking very good on yellow rust control. Um, other products, certainly adding activity uh, as well. Uh, Vertizan, Imtrex, you won't be using them alone, but where you're using them in addition to an azole, you'll be adding to the activity that you get on yellow rust. Comet as well, uh, consistently providing uh, additional yellow rust control. It's not as strong in its own right as the azoles, but it is useful uh, on yellow rust. Looking at the mixtures on the, uh, the right-hand side now, one slight quirk from last year, and I, I wouldn't read too much into it, actually. Um, Segurus, we know that Segurus contains epoxyconazole and um, an STHI that's very active on isoparazam, very active on yellow rust. So it's a little bit of a surprise to see that at the quarter and half rates. It wasn't looking perhaps quite as strong as the others. As I said, I wouldn't read much into that. I think there were foci within this trial the last year, as you often find within yellow rust trials. Uh, and uh, I think when we come on to look at the, the cross-season analysis, that will disappear. Um, but all products really performing very well at a half-label rate or more. As I've just said, if you look over that over two years, that Segurus effect di disappears altogether. We know that that's a decent product on the other rust and would be as good or possibly even better than some of the other SDHI mixtures that are available. <laughs> Again, on the, on the left-hand side here, you can see that separation, really the azoles providing very useful yellow rust activity uh, and clearly the key uh, active ingredient within that. Uh, and Vertizan and Comet uh, really providing useful additional control. If we look at brown rust, I have to go back a year for this. Um, it's relevant to include it because we didn't include the Vertizan plus Ignite curve uh, last year uh, because it wasn't registered at that point. But, um, yeah, very clearly, Proline is a little bit weaker on brown rust. We know that. Uh, but if you add uh, an SDHI to it, you tend to get very good control, as you see on the right-hand side. Uh, Aviator is in there with the rest. I would add a note of caution on brown rust, though. Um, <clears throat> we've tended to be testing brown rust, uh, sorry, products on brown rust in quite protectant situations. It's been quite an easy target for us in recent years. Uh, speaking with Valis in France, I know that they have found SDHIs aren't as effective. They don't believe they're quite as effective as we're seeing here. So I think we, we should be careful and cautious and not perhaps rely too much on the SDHIs for brown rust control. Let's just get a drink. Mm. Yeah, so I think perhaps the message there is, yeah, we, we have got brown rust control, but let's not rely on it too heavily. I just want to touch on what we're seeing with epoxyconazole and proline over the last um, 15 or 20 years. We've been testing epoxyconazole in these trials since... 1995. Um, we've got, in every single season, we've been able to look at what the efficacy was at every single dose rate that we've been testing. And here we've just got, on the left-hand side, the half-label rate. And back in 1995, 
we're probably getting around 90% control from the half label rate of epoxiconazole applied in a protectant situation. Now, these days, we probably would be lucky to get much above sort of 50 or 60% control from that half label rate. There's been a decline, undoubtedly. That's in a protectant situation. Uh, if you increase the rate, if you look at full label rates, the decline does it appear to have been less, uh, where we were getting around 90% control in 1995, um, probably getting 70, 75% control now. So that's epoxiconazole. If we move on and have a look at protheoconazole now, you can see it's exactly the same pattern. We can't go back quite as far with protheoconazole. We started testing that in 2001. Um, but again, we're seeing a decline from roughly around uh, 80, 85 percent uh, in 2001 uh, to around 50, 55 percent now from a half label rate. And again, in a protected situation on the right hand side, yeah, around 70 percent is about the, the, the maximum that we could expect to, to get now um, in a protected situation. If we look at curative activity now, the decline appears more steep. And I'm not sure that it's actually viable to try and fit a line through this. I'm not sure a line is the best analogy. If you look at this, I think you probably would say it was stable for a period initially and then declined more rapidly perhaps in the last six or seven years. Uh, I'll be interested to hear what John has to say about that later uh, from a resistance management perspective or from, uh, from a, a resistance development perspective, I should say. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. Um, if we look at the full label rate as well, it's exactly the same pattern that we're seeing, uh, a rapid decline um, for both half and full label rate, such that really we should only be able to expect around 20 or 30% control uh, in a curative situation from a half or full label rate of epoxiconazole. It's exactly the same with protheoconazole. The curve looks a little steeper, and I'll come on to that in a moment. It isn't steeper, it's exactly the same. Um, and, yeah, again, we're looking at around 20 or 30% control. I think the only reassuring thing that might come out of this is in the last four years, you'd say that they've clustered. Um, you wouldn't say that... We've probably, you might say that it looks like we've stabilised at a lower level of control for the moment, at least. That's what we've seen in the last two or three years. If we look at the same years, of course, those... Lines could be distorted uh, in that you've got a longer time span for opus, so it's, the, the line gradually it does look shallower. If you look over the same time period, you find those lines almost overlap. And so you, we wouldn't say that there was a difference in what we've seen in proline or epoxiconazole. They're pretty much identical in terms of their decline. So really the key messages on Septoria... From the trials in 2013, half rates of the best azoles are giving us around or less than 50% control. That said, all of the SDHI azole mixtures were 90 plus percent control um, and performing very well. Um, so I think the days of using half doses of azoles to control septoria really are gone. Uh, we need to be looking at higher rates than that and possibly using mixtures wherever possible um, to help control. Clearly the SDHIs are very active in their own right. It's very important, though, as I'm sure many of you are aware, um, the SDHIs are considered, um, or rather pathogens are considered likely to, ve to develop resistance to SDHIs, uh, much like they did to strobilurins. Uh, the SDHIs are a single mode of action, uh, and it's in in vital that we manage them and um, use them with the existing chemistry um, to... Firstly, to broaden the spectrum of activity uh, of the tank mix that we put together, or the formulated mix, rather, uh, but also to reduce the resistance risk. Clearly, there are other things out there. There are multi-sites. There's Phoenix, there's Bravo. Both of those will add useful protectant activity on Septoria uh, and help um, control it and protect those products. We haven't shown any yield data from 2013. There's a good reason for that. Um, Disease levels were generally quite low within the trials. We were able to pick out differences, but um, actually differences in green leaf area as a result of that disease control really rarely didn't carry through very well to yield last year. We saw quite large variability within trials as we did within uh, ordinary fields, as well as the fact um, that 
many yields were curtailed by, uh, by quite hot, dry conditions through July. Just on yellow rust there, the SDHIs and strobilians uh, both shown useful additional activity, but the azoles, I think, are key uh, to yellow rust management. Just one slide on stewardship. I did mention this uh, a moment ago. Uh, to maintain their usefulness, there are some very clear guidelines out there as to how we should use them. Um, there is a maximum of two SDHI fungicide-containing sprays as a statutory re requirement now. Um, we should also always be using SDHIs in mixture with at least one fungicide of a different mode of action that has efficacy against the target pathogen that we're, that we're targeting in that particular crop. Uh, you can tank mix two SDHIs, but it's not an anti-resistance strategy. If you are going to do that, you need to be looking as well to add different modes of action in there, just as you would as if you were using a single SDHI. Um, I don't think, actually, there's probably going to be any great benefits from mixing two SDHIs. Um, certainly from a resistance management perspective, it's considered likely that if we do get resistance to SDHIs, it will be complete and across all of the SDHIs rather than specific to any one individual. That said, we, don't, we can't say that categorically. <coughs> Moving on to look at barley, we've got a similarly extensive set of trials uh, across barley uh, with the same organisations involved. Main focus in barley is rhynchosporium and net blotch. Hence, we have three trials looking at rhynchosporium, two at net blotch. And we do also have trials looking at powdery mildew, uh, brown rust, and ramularia as well. Strange season for barley diseases last year. The very dry, cool spring uh, meant that when crops did grow away, they grew away very quickly and tended to grow away from disease. Uh, and so there's a certain level of natural escape that occurred in many barley crops. Um, we did manage to get decent rhynchosporium data, though, from our trials uh, in Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. Uh, some good net blotch data from uh, Yorkshire, uh, as well as some mildew data, actually, from a rhynchosporium trial in Fife. So we've got some data to show you. So I'll go straight on and look at the rhynchosporium data first. 2013, this is the information from three sites here. Um, see Phoenix certainly providing a, a certain amount of rhynchosporium control, which may be useful if we're using that in mixtures. Uh, clearly, protheoconazole is a key active in uh, rhynchosporium and barley disease control generally, uh, and that was performing very well. Uh, matched on either side there with uh, Imtrex and Zulu, the two SDHIs, looking to provide quite similar levels of control to what we've seen from Proline. So clearly the SDHIs are, are very active on rhynchosporium. If you look on the right-hand side, clearly the mixture's a little bit better than that, uh, looking at less than 2% disease from anything over really a half dose of either of those products. It's probably quite difficult to separate those curves uh, based on the 2013 data. Look at the eradicant activity from 2013. Again, um, Proline and the SDHIs on the left-hand side looking very similar in terms of their efficacy. Um, and the mixtures looking slightly better than that uh, on the right. Uh, interesting, Vertizan plus Proline in there again. Um, we saw Vertizan looking to provide possibly good curative activity in Septoria. Well, it seems to be doing something similar in Rinko there, uh, if, if we can pull anything out of that. Um, Adexar and Siltra, very similar in terms of their Rinko efficacy. I suspect that's, that we're seeing such good efficacy from Adexar relates, uh, rela relates to the left-hand side graph there, uh, Imtrex. Floxopyroxide is the active in Adexar, um, and that is performing very well as a solo. We would naturally expect Epoxiconazole, the other partner, to be less active than Proline. Um, so it's clearly it's being supported by its SDHI there. We will move on. Thank you. Um, Rhynchosporium uh, over years now. Uh, this is the eradicant data. Uh, pretty much mirrors what we've just discussed. There's a couple of extra products in here because in 2012 and 2011 we had uh, additional products within the trials and it's reasonable to compare them across the full set of seasons. Uh, and clearly Comet, Paraclostrobin still 
uh, a useful uh, active in rinkosporium control and will add to the activity that we see from other products. Um, Ignite in there, as we said, less active than protheoconazole, we would expect that. Um, and the SDHI is again performing very well. Bontema on the right hand side, I think it's fair to say in a curative situation on rinkosporium, uh, Bontema perhaps needs the addition of an azole with that, probably a low rate of a, a protheoconazole would be effective to bring that up to the mark of the others. But all the other SDHI mixtures performing very well uh, in curative situations on rinkosporium. And looking at the protectant data, again, some separation. We've got Phoenix in there, looking at about 25, 30% control from just adding Phoenix. Um, and the SDHIs, it's a little bit of separation perhaps between Zulu, uh, Isopyrazam, and um, Imtrex there. I should say the Imtrex line on the odd graph here isn't actually coming through in the legend, but it's the black line at the bottom. Um, sorry, dark blue, very dark blue, far bottom left. Um, is Imtrex. On the right-hand side, clearly, a little bit of separation when you look over years. This is quite robust data. We've got Adexar and Siltra really performing very well, um, possibly just giving the edge to Siltra there over the seasons. Uh, on barley mildew, um, this is a single trial from 2013 now, um, as I said, this was a rinkosporium trial. We would usually test straight mildew sites within uh, the mildew trials. It's actually quite useful to see how some of the uh, more conventional products might perform on mildew themselves. Uh, Phoenix, interestingly, providing a certain degree of control there. Actually, the SDHIs themselves, I um, don't think any of them really claim to have much mildew activity, but they all seem to do something on mildew. Um, we see that from Intrex and Zulu. Um, but clearly, um, protheoconazole in itself is very active on barley mildew, and you know, a quarter rate of proline was doing as much as anything. Uh, and actually, if you look on the right-hand side as well, uh, any mixture containing protheoconazole was also performing very well. We've got Vertizan plus proline there, as well as Siltra, uh, and Adexa are pretty close behind that as well. Uh, Bontema also providing a useful level of activity on mildew. I don't think you probably use any of those products specifically for mildew control in barley, uh, but it's useful to get some indication as to how they perform uh, in their own right. If we look at NetBlotch now for a moment, um, this is from 2013 again. Um, you can see there's um, two SDHIs in there, Zulu, uh, Isopyrazam plus Intrex, um, and a little bit of separation between them. Intrex actually looking very strong on net blotch, which is primarily the reason, I guess, as well, why we're seeing a Dexar looking very, very strong on net blotch there again. A little bit of separation there, perhaps, between a Dexar and the other SDHIs, uh, I guess, because both uh, Intrex and uh, Ignite are both actives that are good on net blotch control. If we look over four years, actually, though, the uh, the differences tend to become less apparent in some respects, um, and actually all of the SDHIs perform very well on net blotch at around a half label rate if you look across the seasons. Um, yeah, very hard to pull much out of that at all. It suggests actually it's perhaps as much about timing for net blotch control as it is about product selection. Just looking at barley brown rust for a moment. Uh, this is actually 2010 data. I've had to go back a little bit for this, but I thought it was interesting just to put it in and, and to cover it. Um, I think the real separation here is from the single active products at the top. You've got Opus, Comet, and Proline, all providing a certain degree of control of barley brown rust. But the mixtures are really what's doing the, doing the business. Um, Bontema in here, Siltra, and Adex are all performing very, very well. So if you're looking to control barley brown rust, it, I think mixtures are the way forward. On Ramularia, this is mean of three seasons up to 2012. We didn't get any data on Ramularia last year, unfortunately. Uh, but again, there's various modes of action that are useful on Ramularia. You'll note there are no uh, strobilurins being tested within this. That is because the G143A mutation occurred uh, and they have no efficacy on Ramularia now. Um, but we do have chlorothanol, still very active. Uh, Protheoconazole in its own right is very good. Uh, and Ignite and 
Comet, sorry, not Comet, Ignite and Imtrex SDHI look, looking very good in there as well. Um, the mixtures as well looking good, but I think you'd probably say that of all of the mixtures, Siltra comes out the strongest. So just to round up and conclude on that, um, Siltra and Adexa in 2013 both showed uh, very good broad spectrum activity on barley diseases, consistent with what we've seen in previous years. Um, Proline is still a key active in barley, manage barley disease management uh, and is very effective. I think we shouldn't forget that Comet is an active ingredient that is useful in both net blotch and rinkosporin control and is, uh, has a place alongside other products in controlling those diseases. Uh, and Phoenix, as we've tested it, uh, did show some activity on rinkosporin and mildew, actually, so could be a useful uh, contributor to help us control rinkosporin in the future. Um, clearly, all the SDHI mixtures were performing very well and were quite closely matched, though. That was all I was going to say. Thank you very much.